Hello, IB History Scholars. Welcome back. This is the second part of the outbreak of the Second World War, where I'd like to focus on uh, Japan. And there are some historians that like to make the claim that the Second World War in Asia is really uh, Japan's war. One of those historians has made uh, the assertion that the Japanese ruling circles in the 1930s were united in their view that Japanese power and, and future prosperity rested on carving out a similar to the Western European power empires are for themselves in Asia, reproducing in the Far East what they saw as the dominant features of Western international behavior. So if we think of like some kind of like takeaways from just this little excerpt, uh, for Japan to really be a, a power in Asia, they have to do what the Europeans or the Western powers have been doing. They need to acquire territory uh, in order for them to perhaps expand their influence, uh, pick up uh, needed resources to help industrialize and modernize Japan as well. Now, there are going to be a number of factors that is going to come into play here. So let's just take a look at these right now. One factor that comes into play here that leads to a, a new type of uh, Japan at the end of the 19th and 20th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, is the rise of militarism within Japan. You know, Japan had a strong military tradition uh, it, from the era of the shoguns and the shogunates. The um, samurai code is going to transfer. Uh, when they move from the shogunate period into a more modern period uh, through the Menjai Restoration. And so this is going to be this, this idea of loyalty until death uh, to the emperor and to the state. Uh, there is going to be a push to um, modernize uh, the and expand uh, the national armed forces. And so that's, again, more... Um, uh, westernization of uh, their military and that means like things like uh, training uh, technology and even uh, uh, we're talking about uh, compulsory military uh, service here and then you see this emergence of a uh, militaristic uh, type culture and that's just being reinforced also in in the schools and in, and in the curriculum this idea of um, the importance of of the military. To go along with this, uh, nationalism and emergence of an ideology uh, seems to uh, start um, propping up in the uh, end of the 19th and early 20th century here. And so when we look at what contributes to it, uh, there are a number of, of factors here. Nationalism, uh, nationalists uh, associate expansion with uh, the greater glory uh, of the emperor god and so this could be again a result of the the menjai restoration also part of this uh sense of um, importance national importance uh, is also tied with expansion of territory and so after 1875 we see the emergence of a new industrial military power in japan and they go to places like formosa which we'll just simply call taiwan uh, about 1895, you see them take that over, and then uh, they move on to the Korean Peninsula and just annex it by 1910. So they they are beginning to equate uh, expansion as part of this new national identity. You also see that there are these patriotic associations um, emerging uh, in Japanese society. And it's, they're trying to set up this idea that their traditional culture is, is more superior to the West. And so uh, these are really emerging in the 1920s. They're very ultra-nationalistic, very anti-Western in, in nature. And it does seem, though, to uh, resonate with um, people of, of Japan. And then uh, very similar to militarism, this, this nationalistic uh, feeling and um, the, the, the new ideology is just being uh, reinforced once again in, in the schools, in the type of curriculum uh, that uh, is being developed here. And But uh, in the 1920s and definitely in the 1930s, there are going to be some economic press pressures for Japan. And if they are going to uh, really 
uh, become an industrialized power, uh, they need to kind of shore up some of their, their, their weaknesses. There is this idea that um, countries need to be self-sufficient, uh, especially economic self-sufficient. We're going to call that autarky. Well, Japan is an island nation. It's, it doesn't have um, a lot of natural resources that is going to be conducive to an industrial base. So they need to find it. And so the military... Uh, is going to be perhaps uh, the vehicle uh, to find that solution to uh, shore up their essential um, raw materials that they need for modern uh, technology and for the, this modern military that they're going to create. And so uh, Manchuria is going to be the big temptation for them. And they move into uh, Manchuria in 1931. And the civilian government is not really strong. There's not a lot of stopgap measures to help prevent the, the military uh, from doing what they did. And they had moved into uh, Manchuria, which had created a huge outcry by uh, Western powers. Um, and that's what it did. It created outcry, but they really didn't back it up with any um, military uh, measures. Uh, and in many cases, remember, there's uh, a global depression that is occurring and so there there are things that are, are pre preoccupying uh, western powers here and then by the early 1930s this this idea this notion of a co-prosperity zone is being talked about amongst um, military and uh, high-ranking uh, government officials that um Perhaps they need to create this economic zone, uh, this economic sphere of influence in uh, Asia. And the idea is uh, removing Western influence and allowing Japan to kind of fill this, this void um, where the Western powers had been. And this, is, this would be a potential economic solution to, to problems that uh, Japan is facing. Uh, what could complicate it a little bit, though, is uh, the the civilian government uh, is not fully on board yet. So it's going to have to it's going to have to change. And slowly, you're going to start seeing um, military um, personnel find their way into uh, the government. And so Japan after uh, World War I, uh, begins to emerge really as a, as a world power. And the government uh, becomes heavily influenced um, by the military. Like I said, military officers are going to find their way into positions. There really is a lack of checks uh, within uh, the government. Uh, so uh, democracy is, is fragile here. And Japan basically is working on developing uh, a way to make Asia independent, free from uh, colonial powers. And, and then once that happens, they will fill that void and they would be the protectors. And so, again, this is a part of this uh, co-prosperity uh, sphere that um, is being uh, talked about amongst uh, military and high-ranking government officials here. This, uh, this sphere of influence really would be for Japan. Uh, they may project it kind of like Asia for Asians, but really it's Asia for uh, Japan. And once they start pushing out Western powers and they start doing that, uh, they begin to uh, exploit and oppress uh, people living in these areas. And they set up puppet regimes that will work uh, with uh, the Japanese government. So what we see by uh, the 1930s is Japan is definitely in a position for uh, war. Uh, one might say that uh, it's not, may not have been their full intentions, but it becomes part of um, their diplomacy and it becomes uh, a reality uh, once they 
uh, move into Manchuria in uh, 1931. But what leads up to that, up to that point, though, is uh, in the 20th century, their path towards war uh, might have been more um, of a process compared to Germany, where once Adolf Hitler took over in 1933, uh, in a matter of about six, seven years, uh, there's war in Europe. Uh, in, in Asia, Japan, uh, once the war with uh, Russia is concluded about 1904 or five, uh, then it's, it's moving in, going to slowly move in that direction to where you get the Manchurian incident in 1936. Uh, it's a matter of like 21 years, um, leading up to, uh, the Manchurian incident and then, uh, almost uh, another decade, so 31 years, by the time the attack uh, occurs on Pearl Harbor, in, which brings in the United States. Uh, when we look at this path, um, in there, Japan is uh, looking to find itself as, as a world power and does not feel it's being respected as a world power. Uh, you can see that with the 21 demands about wanting more influence in China. You can see that uh, with uh, what they called mutilated victory uh, from World War One, where they don't think they're being treated fairly at Versailles. They even throw out the race issue. Uh, when you look at the Washington conferences, uh, the four power, the five power, the nine power, uh, you have uh, Japan feels it's not being respected, that the formulas are just not working in their favor. It's working more in the Western powers favor. Uh, and so by uh, the early 30s, Japan is really in a position where uh, they are um, isolated, that they simply leave uh, some of these international organizations and agreements like the League of Nations and uh, the Washington Conference. And for them to really create their co-prosperity sphere, they really need to take on, on China. And so you get the Sino-Japanese War, and they struggle with that one. And, and as they're struggling with the Sino-Japanese War, they become very desperate with their efforts and their negotiations with the United States because the United States is reacting to what they are, what the Japanese are doing in Asia. Uh, they are stepping up their sanctions and um, protocols against Japan, which forces Japan to attack the United States in 1941. Uh, so with that, uh, we have uh, the outbreak of the Second World War in Asia.